Hi, welcome to another edition of AC Theory. So we're ready to start new material now. So we've been talking about these things called uh, DFAs and NFAs. And what they recognize, of course, are the regular, and that was a terrible U, regular languages. And then we started to talk about CFGs and uh, PDAs. And those are, of course, the context free languages. And we saw some languages that weren't even context free. So for example, A to the N, B to the N, C to the N with N at least zero is not a CFL, a context free language. And it's pretty uh, evident that if we wrote a computer program to check whether a string has the same number of A's, B's, and C's in it, and with A's before B's before C's, we can easily do that. So what we want here is we want a model that is equal in some sense to a real quote unquote computers, whatever in the world that means. Okay, And we, we want this uh, model to be kind of like uh, these ones up here, um, but what we want them to be is equivalent to what we can do. So that if we can find some problem that this whatever model can't do, then therefore our computers can't do. So it's kind of like the end of the line in some sense. So if we encounter something that's equivalent to our model and what we understand as computers that we use every day, then if we can't solve it in this model, then because it's equivalent to our computers, we can't do it ourselves. There's no point investing into those into trying to solve those problems because they're impossible to solve. Okay, so uh, normally when I teach this in these in my classes, I would go into like the motivation in terms of how this came about and like the history of it. But I'm going to just skip right to the punchline, and we're going to talk about something called a Turing machine, named after Alan Turing. And no, he did not name it himself. <laughs> Other people named it after him because uh, he was so important to uh, computing that I was terrible. Turing machine. So what is a Turing machine? The whole basic idea is try to generalize what a PDA can do. So uh, the idea is that instead of a tape, so we don't, uh, sorry, instead of a stack, so we don't have a stack anymore, instead we have a tape. And the way that this works is that we have a tape that looks like this, so it kind of looks like a, a stack that we <laughs> rotated on the side. And, it, and in some sense, it kind of is a, a stack. Let me change this to purple. And in each one of the, uh, on this tape, we have a bunch of cells, just like a stack, uh, no different than a stack. And what we're going to do is we're going to put the input on the tape. So let's say uh, that we have input W1 through uh, Wn like this. So uh, W1 through Wn is the input here. And in order to investigate what is happening on the tape and what the, the input is, we have something called a tape head. So this is something called the tape head. head. And what it's able to do is it's able to move uh, left and right, uh, e either uh, backward or forward, one position at a time, uh, as well as read the contents of the cell, and as well as change the contents of a cell. Okay, so it's able to see, uh, look at this W1 right here and see, okay, yeah, it is a, a W1 right here then maybe I'm going to say, I'm going to move right. And so after whatever's going to happen next, it's going to, the tape head is going to point at this cell right here. And we can say, oh, we're going to change that W1 into an A, for example. And so what would happen is, is that I change this to be an A. And then this cell is permanently going to change, oh, sorry, not permanently. It's going to permanently change until I come back and change it possibly at some later point. So it's not like a DFA where we can only move right 
and we and so therefore we can't go back. But even if we could go back, uh, uh, we couldn't change the contents of the cell. So with a Turing machine, you're allowed to change the contents of the cell. And what happens if we are positioned right here at the very last cell of the input, and maybe we change it or not, it doesn't matter. What if we decide to move right here? Then what will happen is anytime we try to move right past the end of the input, then we're going to get some new memory. And what is going to be placed there is something called a blank cell. So, and this will be permanently attached to the, to uh, whatever we have so far, anytime we encounter it or, um, or create it. So let's just say I'm right here and I move right, then this cell is going to forever be in our picture. We're always going to see this cell at some point uh, in, in what we have of the tape. And the reason why that's important is that this tape is one way infinite. So infinitely, it can go infinitely far that way. So at every single point, we're only going to see a finite slice of the tape. But the key is that we can have this grow as much as we want. We can make this tape, we can just keep going right as much as we want and potentially never stop at that point, okay? So, uh, so some quirks here that you may be asking. Uh, what happens, uh, I'll just write it, what happens if we move uh, left off the first cell in the tape. So if we're in this cell over here and we decide to move left, since it's only one way, uh, what, what actually happens? So there are two philosophies here. Either you can just say, uh, you just stay in this cell, you don't actually move left, or you can say that the computation actually stops, or the machine stops. And so the, the perspective we'll take uh, here is that the machine stops. Okay, so that, that, that's just a simple quirk that might happen. Another quirk that might happen is, uh, could we potentially just keep going right forever? And uh, the answer to that is yes. So can we move right forever? And the answer in this case is going to be yes. So I'm not going to restrict you just to keep moving right. Um, you could reason that the machine doesn't really do anything at that point, and we're going to have to uh, take a look at that when we define the model precisely. But that's essentially what a Turing machine is, a one-way infinite tape where you present the input at, adjusted at the beginning of the tape right here. And uh, if you try to go off the left, then you're going to, the computation stops. The, the terminology there is quote unquote hanging yourself, but it's, that's not a really nice term. So it, you, the computation stops. Uh, you can move left and right one cell at a time every single uh, transition. Uh, you can change a cell to be any uh, value that you want as long as you specify what things can be stored there in the first place. And if you try to move right uh, past the furthest thing that you've ever seen, then you're, go you're going to acquire a new uh, blank cell. And this cell operates just like any other cell here. You can change it to be anything. In fact, you can change any of these over here to be blank cells also. You, you don't have to keep these non-blank or whatever. All right, so let's look at a more formal uh, definition of a Turing machine. So uh, it's a state-based machine just like the DFAs and PDAs were. So Q is a finite set of states. Okay, uh, we have an input alphabet just like before. So this guy is also finite, no difference there. Uh, we have a so I didn't actually use this for PDAs, but it's kind of important here. Uh, we have a uh, set gamma, which is the tape alphabet. So it's the set of all things that are belonging on the tape. And one thing we can notice is that sigma 
is a subset of gamma. And why is that the case? Because the input is presented on the tape. So the cells of the input better be able to be put on the tape in the first place. So all the input characters are in the, the tape alphabet. But one other thing we should notice is that the blank cell is in the tape alphabet, obviously, because we need to acquire new cells, possibly, and we need to put blank cells on there. But we're going to say that the blank cell is not in the, in the input alphabet. Why is that the case? Well, imagine what would happen if we had an input that had only blanks in it. So let's just say that this is the input right here, right here. How would you know whether or not this is the empty string or an input with uh, three blanks in it? You don't actually know because the blanks are all the same. So uh, we're going to say that the blank cell is a special symbol that is only on the tape but not in the input. So if we do get something like this, we know it is the empty string at this point because there's uh, the first cell is a blank and the blank cell is not an input character. Okay, so what else do we have? Well, we have a start state. So this is just uh, Q0, same as before. So this is the start state, nothing special. But one thing to keep in mind is that when we talked about DFAs, just as an example, uh, you can think of that as a Turing machine that only moves right, as I mentioned before. And once the input is done, aka we hit the first blank cell, then we, we can just stop at that point because the DFA is never going to go backward through the input. So when if we allow the Turing machine to change cells at arbitrary points in the in the input, then the then what happens is that we don't know when we're actually done um, necessarily because uh, it can't just be that when we go through the input we're done because we might come back through the input and then change cells later and then do some more work. So we can't uh, just say that a certain cell is a final state or not a final state. We need a special place to, to force the machine to stop and the way to do that is we're going to have two states, uh, Q accept and Q reject. So these are two special states. So this is the accepting state. So it is a, 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 a special state um, for purposes of accepting the input. And we're going to have an explicit reject state. And the reason, another reason why this is important is at every single point, we will always have a transition to apply, assuming we don't hit the left hand of the, of the tape and go left or whatever, assuming we don't do that. Um, we will always have a transition to do. So because there's always a transition to do um, and there's no, no way to classify whatever what state is a final state or not, we need an explicit state that if we enter these states, then we must stop. So the behavior of these two states right here is that if they are entered, the machine halts. And so this is a special term. So halts, um, let me write it better. So halts. So this means uh, either accepts or rejects, depending on what we're doing. So whether or not we enter the accept state or the reject state means we accept or reject the input. Whereas with the DFA, you just had to go to the uh, final state after having read all the input. And, and same thing with the PDA. We need an explicit state to actually say, we're going to stop right now and accept or reject, whatever the case may be. Okay, and then the final piece, and I'm going to do it in red, is delta, which is the transition function. So this is the transition function. And how does it work? Well, it's a state-based machine just like before. So we have to take a state and we need to be able to look at the cell that, that the tape head is looking at and then decide what we need to do. So those are the only things, the pieces of information we need to know. So delta is going to be a transition, uh, a function from Q times a gamma because we got to take a state and a tape symbol and 
it's okay because uh, we don't have to put the input alphabet or whatever here because we, we can just define this for any uh, tape characters that are not part of the input because all input characters are in the tape alphabet anyway. So this is totally fine. And once we do that, we want this machine, at, for now at least, to be deterministic. So we got to figure out what state to go to. So Q here. And we also need to figure out what thing to write into that cell, whatever one that we're looking at. So Q cross uh, gamma again. because So gamma on the, on the right is the thing we write. Actually, I should write all these. So this is the state that we are currently in. So this is the current state. So this is the observed uh, uh, cell content. Uh, whatever is in that cell. This Q is the uh, next state that will be wherever we're going to. This gamma is what we are writing into that cell, whatever we're writing into that cell. It could be exactly the same thing, but we're always going to be writing something into the cell. It could be the same, that's totally fine, but we're always writing something. And and then after that, we need to figure out whether to move left or right. So I'm going to put cross the set, which contains two special symbols. They're not anything on the input alphabet or tape alphabet or whatever. It's just to specify the transition function and to make the Turing machine state diagrams later. So it's just a set with two things in it. And we choose either we go left or we go right. So this will be the direction of the tape head, okay, uh, whatever it moves left or right. And one thing that we will also note is that delta is a total function. And we, I mentioned this when I talked about DFAs way back when, but this just means that no matter what state you have and whatever con style content you have, you will always have exactly one transition to do. And, and that is exactly the same idea as a DFA, except we have uh, two things to worry about instead of one. Actually, no, no, we, we have two things just like, like DFAs had. Every state has every possible um, uh, input character in a transition going out. Same thing here, but it's cell content instead of uh, input content. Cool. So that's a Turing machine, and that is the formal definition of a Turing machine. So it's got seven pieces, believe it or not, but all of them are important, and we will be doing some more examples in the coming uh, days. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave your thoughts about Turing machines down in the comments below. As always, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. I'm currently doing one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring sessions. So if you want to schedule one, please contact me at the email link in the, in the uh, description. Can't talk. And as always, I'll see you next time.